thing is wrong. Woo! The hip hop writer is a creator, composing, understanding words of culture, brilliance, powering a rebalance of the elements equally. Pages of rejuvenated reaffirmation, simply the almighty leadership of insightful craft work that stands to build through any confrontation born to be. Yet his daily duty is as a journalist that questions properly and uses his ears to filter the real. And as the art decays by dilution, he concentrates the best again and again and again, exposing it in the print. Today's journalist and tomorrow's historian, he listens to share. Here is that necessary attempt executed again and again and again, this is the Power Right Show on S Street Media. This is your brother, the lone low life with the home sewn garment, the Boricua with the build, the true and living God stepping in score, Sunya Allah, aka Skillustrator Low. And we're on S Street Media, the evolution of media, where every intrigue will have its own show, every incredible thought will have its own episode, and every timeless insight will be archived. And this particular show, this show right here, is about my element of hip hop, the writer of what I call art on art and science on music. The only show in history on the hip hop writer element that I, a veteran of nearly 25 years, uh, helped pioneer. Helped pioneer by saying what it ought to be uh, and displaying it. It ought to be a creative venture of covering the works that we love, you know? And that's where the art and art comes. It's the crucial thing. But also trying to inject more science on music, you know what I mean? Um, and analyzing it from us that make this music, that are from this music, that are from this culture, this culture of expressions that this music comes from, you know? Um, I also have a date, October 11th, my book, The Filtered Real, Essays from the Invisible Renaissance, will be out on paperback and ebook. Um, you'll be able to go straight to Amazon and pick either or, whatever you want, both, you know, if you're really on, on that, you know, hopefully. And uh, we're going to have a lot, of, a lot of promotion and a lot of wonderful events to, to, to lead up to that. And um, it's really a collection of essays that display that art on art, poetic prose. But in this book, more so, really focusing on trying to begin to put the music of this decade that I call the Invisible Renaissance into some kind of perspective. And I mainly use the works of 2018, which was a stellar year, but then I use that to branch off into a lot of other ideas and a lot of other music and a lot of other insights from artists that are not, that did not just make music in 2018, but throughout the decade. And um, it, it's, if you know my work that over this decade I've published almost 200 articles this is just a, a scratch the surface um work and it, it can't cover the entire invisible renaissance that's why i said it's from this era but it's a beginning start that no one is doing no one is compiling this amount of detail into this and putting into context what we have you know and 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 doing it as what i say is an element so it's going to be a literally a concrete proof one of the first of what this element is. And trust me, I got at least four other books done and another one that I started now, which will be, they, they ain't come with that shit yet. You know, they ain't come with that yet. You know, I can't even, I can't even share the ideas of these books. You know what I mean? Because we'll get somebody to do in a low budget, ver the USPA version of my ideas and shit. You know what I mean? The, um, I just found this out, so I just have to throw a, or remembered in perfection. May his works be revered in po posterity. Uh, DJ Chaos of the Artifacts. You know, Elder Sensei confirmed it. Um, he passed away. I don't know what. It doesn't doesn't matter to anyone really what it was right now, um, except his 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 closest family and loved ones. But uh, I will tell you this: the I only got to meet DJ Chaos once. I saw him spin his, uh, I saw him spin twice um, for the Artifacts live. And, um, and I've seen the Artifacts perform by themselves solo, and I've seen him perform as a duo, and then I've seen him perform with DJ Chaos. And the synergy with DJ Chaos, though, adds that element that truly you realize what a group that they were. But I think I may want to be one of the people in this decade to have the honor to kind of give him a retrospective interview 
all three of them together. And uh, thanks to DJ Toshi, I was able to do that at, I think it was his 200th episode and uh, celebration. We may have went to, I think it was the Karma Lounge. I think it was the Karma Lounge. I'm not sure right now what it was. But, um, you know, that was recorded and it's on video. And uh, I'll actually put that, that link in the, uh, you know, if you're on my social media, at Sunez, whenever I share, wherever I'm sharing this episode of the Power I Show episode, this episode 53, I'll put that link so you can go check out the, uh, the interview I did with Artifacts that included DJ Chaos. You know, and like a lot of the great DJs, he wasn't really speaking so much, you know what I mean? But he definitely was affirming many of the things that we were talking about and, and that I was leading into with my questions. Because, yes, a journalist does lead with his questions. You know, uh, he intends to get particular types of answers. And hopefully, if the subject is really a great subject to interview, he gets um, a challenge to the lead that he's giving. If it's contrary to that interviewee, you know what I mean? You know, we lead them to what we want to say. But... Um, if they're really a great interviewee, they're also going to disagree where they can. And that makes it a great interview and stuff because this is what we have our own perceptions or we're representing the perceptions that people have of the artist or the particular individual that's being interviewed. And that's why a journalist will propose those things. Problem is that a journalist is supposed to know those perceptions that people have, but also all of the other things that they don't, that the people wouldn't normally know so that they can know what true light the particular artist or individual deserves to have and then also guide them there as well. Well, you rewind this, though, See, uh, so you can get that jewel, you know? But um, I can't really continue without speaking about two issues. You know, people know me as very militant, very revolutionary, and then they're tuning into the show. And I'm just talking about beats, you know? Me, me and the guy, we're producing the show. We're talking about music and on air, you know, you know, we talk about how he's he's been a woo hater and, and trying to correct him, you know what I mean? And I'm and and all this other music, you know, of course I'm exaggerating about him, but you know. But um and like you know, where is Sunya's thoughts about all these mass shootings or his thoughts about Puerto Rican independence? Because that's for those that know me and how I got knowledge itself, if there was one way uh, one direction that definitely led me closer to the knowledge itself, it wasn't because I lived in a neighborhood that had it. Um, it was it was obviously the music and me trying to understand the music as a journalist and finding more and more about it. But at the same time, also, right? Um, you know, meeting me. Uh, let me finish that other part. Meeting those artists, meeting those particular artists as well. And being directed in that kind of way and seeing what that really meant. But also going to college and being very radicalized toward a, a, a freedom fighting mentality and realizing as a developing writer that I was, that that was the, the lineage that I was going to put myself in as that type of writer and speaker that supported and aligned himself with the independence of his own immediate peoples where he immediately came from in Puerto Rico, but also the entire black diaspora that he's coming from. And um, in these last couple episodes, I've been doing something that most people that think that they're militant don't do and people that wish they were militant aren't doing. And that is, I don't comment immediately because I'm doing the knowledge. You see? Particularly the Puerto Rican independence zone, I'm going to leave it very succinct and brief. The Puerto Rican independence movement, though, is being led by different individuals, a new, an entirely new crop of young people. And I was quick to be enthused by the wording and the ideas of, let's say, for example, Black Lives Matter. But then throughout these years, if you notice, it's been less about Black Lives Matter and less about people's uh, sexual freedom slash um, a, a, a woman's liberation movement that is more similar 
to a woman, a white woman's lack of prejudice movement as opposed to a black woman's freedom movement. And when we look at the Black Lives Matter movement and see its origins of funding and see its origins of its founders and, and its original you know, movers and shakers, then we see where that ends up you know, and how police brutality has not been the immediate platform. You know, how there hasn't been a union of our movements to say, when we say black lives matter, is it a part of the black diaspora? The early part of this decade, there was a large movement that became frayed because they don't know what black is and only deal with phenotype and not really the essence of the genotype. And that means they're not dealing with what's in the blood, they're dealing with what, what they see in the eye only. And the Afro-Latino movement kicked in. But the Black Lives Matter movement never really embraced the Afro-Latino movement. So both of those movements fizzled. And then they just became angry black woman movements of two different variations. And I'll be serious with you. I said in the beginning of this that you do the knowledge. And one of the things that our great sisters that are really fighting for some kind of freedom or liberation or better equality, they haven't really done the knowledge historically. They've just been clever enough to dismiss uh, the mentalities of, uh, uh, of the movements prior as being misogynist or incomplete, which they were, and not really seeing the real pitfalls that were, that were aligned with them, you know? It's, it's insufficient to just um, speak about misogyny or the way women are treated and feel that that was the only major reason that our movements um, faltered. There's also the other idea, and why I haven't spoken about this much though as well is because when we take our ideas of freedom and liberation, we have to think about what do they mean. They have to include dealing with the populace and seeing the direction that the populace wants. And the truth is that when we take time to look at what the populace wants, they may not want what is best for them. They may not want what is what we see is right and exact for them, even if we could prove it on pencil, pencil and paper to the T and to the last digit. And at the same time, though, if I could speak personally, I have always felt as I learned these years, in these last 20, plus, 20 years teaching youth that are at risk, that are desiring to be radicalized, and thus, even though they may gain some kind of knowledge, there's, there's just easily led to manipulation. They can easily led, be led in the wrong direction. And so to me, the most important thing that our people need is still going to be a knowledge of self to be able to look at what they are and say what is this diaspora I'm part of what is the nature of this culture and within myself what are the inherent powers and abilities that are shown and proven within myself that no man can take even if we are never granted a paper a papered independence even if we are never granted the ability to be in communities then they're not free of danger you see and that in lies the other tragedy that we are dealing with though a continuation of sorts more mass shootings and I'll leave it there mass shootings and now some of my brown brothers and sisters are recognizing that they shoot you too they don't ask if you're an illegal immigrant. They identify if you're brown, and then they shoot you. So I had a piece in the Knowledge of Self anthology that I co-edited. It's a little bit diluted. I didn't get to write it as raw as I as the it wasn't as it wasn't the original raw piece that I had intended to use. A more simplified piece for to agree with my my editorship. But I had a piece called For the Revolutionaries. 
And one of the main aspects of that piece was I'm not going to be sitting here and telling you what we need to do to deal with mass shooters or what other people deal with mass shooters. It's silly. It's silly. I feel silly to go on social media where 95% of the people on social media are grown folk and tell them that we have a president that is actually fomenting and enabling and doing something in a better fashion than all of the evil presidents before him. The imperialist continuing presidents before him that have sought to destroy and blood suck consistently our communities. People think that the problem is Trump. All the while, Trump may be one of the most effective presidents in the history of the United States of America. So when I talk about revolution, this revolution is off air. This revolution is still not televised. This revolution will still entail the way that you prepare yourself when no one is watching you type, when no one is watching you post, when no one is watching you share, when no one is watching you IG live. The places where the classrooms are quiet for the individuals. The parts of my own Peace course that aren't being filmed by my brother, Infamega. What are you doing behind the doors to keep yourself ready? We have mass shooters though. Any old wild cracker can come shoot you. And you're gonna prepare yourself for that by posting for people to help you, posting for a politician to do something about gun control. That sounds silly. That sounds silly. And then they tell us in the hood and the, the Republicans are saying this has nothing to do with gun control. And then they note how all of us are killing each other in Chicago. Gun control is a, is a side note. You know what I'm saying? It's a side note. They control the guns. They take away all the AK-47s from the average crazy, crazy kid. Crazy white kid, because that's what we're worried about here. And what'll happen is it'll just be a mass of white kids. They'll use tiki torches. They'll use something. The hatred has been enabled. So you better learn how to turn off the radio, a.k.a. today's social media and prepare yourself, prepare your mind, prepare your body, prepare your physical. People talk about all this stuff about, you know, gun control, this and that, and preparation. Instead of watching the MMA, learn some martial arts. Instead of watching MMA, learn martial arts, because the first aspect of martial arts that you'll need is good eyes. The greatest martial artist profile the individuals that might be of harm, right? The police profile us though, then we have to learn how to pre-profile and realize that these cops might be profiling me. This is the kind of things that we have to learn and you can't learn them online asking for politicians to do something for you, asking people and demanding people to do things for you. That's side work. That's alternate work, not the first work. So when people ask me, where are my thoughts on this show about these issues? 52, ti 52 times a year, for three plus hours, I teach the youth in a particular place of how to deal with themselves, how to deal with the outside environment, and how to learn about themselves, about the excellence of themselves, the depths of their knowledge, the capability of their learning, 
and all of the protocols to be a great man and woman. So here in the Power Rights Show, we got time to talk about beats. We got time to talk about rhymes. On that note, since we're on the militant talk and you want something, I do do a segment called the Peace Corps Snotes. And I'm doing this because of my older brother, Allah B. He, you know, I read the recent book put together by a lot of the great elders. And I was there for much of this. When they needed witnesses, I was one of the honored witnesses. They spelled my name wrong in the book. But that's neither here nor there. We'll get that on the reprint. The book is The True History of Allah and It's 5%. The book could be bought on Amazon and it could be bought on Kindle for a very, very low price, a very excellent price. It's a 400 plus page book about older gods and their experiences with Allah the Father, the founder of the 5% nation of gods and earths. And it shows you about a time period where people were not, our people were not considered humane, they were not considered human. And how the Father went in the streets and not only uplifted them with ideals of themselves, but also the truth about a knowledge of themselves as a supreme being. And that they have no limitations as a scientific fact. And it is for us, them back then, them now, and for us to constantly show and prove that by our study. And I mention this though because the book is long and I have to highlight because I told Allah B, I thought that the book is long as is long and it ends with a wonderful piece by Allah B who really wrote it I think had the most artistic piece in the book you know he really um, he really dressed it up you know what I mean he wrote with a lot of charisma a lot of dynamic essence and um, because the chronology was not edited and it was cut off for the next edition, I think that it not only merits another reading to really understand it, but also would merit another reading anyway, just to see the, the quality of that writing and, and, and really captured the soul, the, 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 that vibe that, that, that the father always was known to have and that I heard from all the elders that taught me, including, of course, a lot of B. So it's a great book. If you want to get more of a um, of a more advanced view about this nation, how it felt in those early times, this de definitely the book, you know, and it's on Amazon, you know. Um, I always do an art on art recital. One of the books I'm going to have published soon, uh, soon after this one. Um, is going to be just on the, the poetic prose that I've been writing all these years. And that's going to be called Art and Art Tentatively. Um, this is in the book as well, in that book as well. This one is called Stoned. If you know, I wrote this one for a piece on Stoneface, you know. Very, the Stone Age album, his debut, came out, um, I think that was 2000. 18 or 17 but um very dope album very dope and uh i tried a couple of times just wasn't able to get him up here in the studio but um this piece is called stoned speeds that few to relativity so set just stone face the only sane liquid steeped in the utensil that transfers my thoughts i move my hand in the manner i think degrees of 56 the god knows the gods know this tempo Records been the sidemen in my corner, yet my words have them cuts the models they throw on white towels up on. Upon my wild idea of preserving innovation that ain't never fluttered, iron butterflies ciphering in dangerous swirls, cameled wings flap over the metal low cookie with my sacred word in the universal flagstone. I will it all to work. Those who love me hope it heals me. Time so synced with the people's convenient cynicism, them clones move freely, yet I, in stillness, 
So stone face. This archaic era, any moment manhandled into posted capital. They say I've been blinded, but I know I've only been dramatically minded. My eyes become reverted pupils in the classroom of my roaming thoughts. I seen my eyes before principal, every last period penned. I'm a bad motherfucker. That piece, uh, it's one of my one of my favorite ones. But um, going on, what the core of probably what I'll talk to, but I might add a couple of records. I wanted to spend the bulk of this, the essence of this, um. And for those who finally, you know, in October get my book and start reading it and talk about the Invisible Renaissance, and they're like, you know, he does reference a lot the Dark Ages, you know, and uh, calls the 2000s the Dark Ages. I'm going to have a book later that goes more into the Dark Ages, but uh, the in this Medium Mutations lengthy segment, I want to give a introduction to the Dark Ages, what I call the Dark Ages, why I call it that. You know, um, so let's start with like the definition, like what do I call the dark ages? Like, what is it? The dark ages to me is the entire 2000s from 2000 to 2009, although its origins are with certain individuals much earlier, like, you know, we'll name individuals like P Diddy, you know what I mean? Name individuals like Jay-Z, they, they, you know, Eminem. They are crucial to the Dark Ages, and they come about, their careers begin, and they begin to surface or begin their careers powerfully uh, in the 90s. It begins with them, and some of the major things that usher in the Dark Ages, those crucial events happen in the very late 90s, particularly 99, maybe even 98. Right, but um, it's from 2000 to 2009 because the point of the Dark Ages and the reason I call it the Dark Ages is because the best did not get a chance to flourish, and this is where you saw what truly is hip hop becomes redefined. So literally, I'm gonna speak for a minute about why talking about hip hop. Many of the things that we see bad about hip-hop today originated during this time. It really flowered and became what it was and became a standard during this era of the 2000s. And one of them, though, is the loss of criteria. You know what I mean? The loss or ignoring of criteria, you know? So let me first explain what I mean by criteria and how it references to just this show, you know? I saw A.G., Andre the Giant from Digging in the Crates, right? In his Facebook page, he was talking about that the truth is, you know, he's saying the truth, this is his truth, you know, about what hip-hop is, and that it includes all different types of hip-hop. So, for the sake of naming things incorrectly or disrespectfully, he named things, and I don't remember exactly, so with that disclaimer, something like gangster rap, of the you know in the 2000s like a uh, uh, a 50 cent or a more backpack rap like uh oriented underground rap like a Jay Dilla and things like that this is a completely wrong interpretation of what hip hop really is so understand the criteria for example and look at it through the way I'm judging the criteria because there's a very clear criteria that allows people to listen to this show and allows them to either dismiss it and accept it or understand the framework of my criteria so that they can say, this is the way he uses criteria so I know what type of music he is seeing within what the scope of hip hop is. It's always clearly understood. To rank hip hop categorically is one of the worst ideas to, to have because the 2000s mixed and muddled that concept. It forced the most talented MCs to package their rap in a, in a different, in a different, in a more segmented, more rudimentary, more easily definable way. So like for example, Tragedy Gaddafi has some of the best albums of the 2000s, right? And 
never got the notoriety that he deserved all the while. And this is me saying this. This is not tragedy saying this. Because people know I know tragedy. He's been on the show. Brothers, respect what I'm saying. I am not talking for tragedy Gaddafi. I'm talking for myself. And the way I have chronicled this, the way I was there for certain people chronicling this, lousy and wrong. 50 Cent was considered the gangster rap and that model became also what eventually becomes a peak of hardcore as an example. But those roots run a little bit earlier from the very late 90s and, the, and really the beginnings of DMX. And not necessarily DMX and his music, but DMX and the sound that developed from DMX. Okay? So, in there we're looking at Swiss beats, right? And that kind of sound. By the end of the 90s, for example, you know, you have a diluting of, of the track. You no longer hear people filtering drums. I'll give you an example of a good group that stopped filtering the drums and just used it as a one-time thing. And that would be The Roots. The Roots... My favorite album of theirs, arguably, and not arguably, absolutely an essential album in their collection, a classic of the culture. 1996's Illadelf Half-Life, he was sampling his own drums so he could filter them. So when you listen to that album, it sounds dirtier than the follow-up the next year, the, the, the next album follow-up in 99, uh, um, Things Fall Apart with the hit song, You Got Me, right? The music itself is progressive, but the drums itself go for a louder, high-pitched snare snap and try to give it, and it has its respect because it has that high live vibe to it, but it doesn't have the thickness in it that Illadelph Half-Life had. Why, why was this so? If I was asking Questlove, I would, I would ask him if the climate of the times favored that. For him to make something innovative, but within the scope of what people were feeling is what hardcore was becoming. A great, another great example, without me detailing it fully, the music of Big Pun's Capital Punishment versus Big Pun's po post posthumous album last posthumous full album in in 2000 early 2000 um yeah baby when you listen to the boom bap that is on capital punishment i'm going to keep it real i don't think it's of the quality of that time that's how but that's not to diss big pun's record it's to show you how high the level of musicianship because that's a year that aquem and i with next level musicianship, um, for me, not the level of musicianship of, say, uh, uh, Atlians, but still, you know, classic, next classic, or Moment of Truth, or Killer Army's second album, Dirty Weaponry. That is a very, very, what people today would call lo fi, analog, thick album. Um, What's another good example? Gangstar's Moment of Truth, what I thought was the best record of that year, um, then and until today. Um, the Purest of Boom Bap. Uh, Pete Rock's Soul Survivor, right? Things Fall Apart is not thick like that. So I'm showing you the trend. Big Puns is still hardcore Boom Bap, but look at Yeah Baby in 2000. The work, and I'm only naming Swiss Beats, but there's others that are worse. They diluted and over-trebled the tracks. And so they, the tracks end up being more melodified and hook-laden. You know, the, the entire Locks catalog is an example. You know what I mean? People say, oh, I'm listening to hardcore boom bap, but it's hardly a purity, that musical sound that they have. Hardly. Hardly.
let's isolate the locked albums and give me the locked albums and instrumental. Give me the Rough Riders Volume 1s and 2s albums. Give me Dragon's album on instrumental. Listen to the beats on Yeah Baby versus Capital Punishment. Versus Fat Joe's 1998 album. Possibly one of the last before he totally diluted his sound. Because you see it in Fat Joe's progression as well. This is what I'm talking about. And so then you categorize it and say, oh, look, I, it's hardcore rap and not because the music of, in the 2000s, the music of 50 Cent and, 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 and Tragic Gaddafi would both be put in the lump of gangster rap. And they are completely different. When you thought you had gangster shit, when you thought you had gangster rap, I was listening to Tragedy Gaddafi. I had the better music. Point blank. You were doing happy birthday songs with a hit album with quality music. Quality music nonetheless. But a diluted hardcore. And for me, this is my, my opinion, and I'm, I say it's my opinion now because I'm not breaking down the album and showing you why. But boy, that 50 Cent Day, you know, 50 Cent 2003 album, that second half, I've never seen an album that people think is classic. Pitfall, this side of Cameron's Purple Haze. People call them classic. And this is another example. Another aspect of the Dark Ages is the media guiding people to like a lot of diluted music. And you know why? Because behind the scenes, while you were liking it and getting nothing out of it, behind the scenes, when they liked stuff, they were getting stuff behind the scenes. The, the fruition, the peaks, the moments that the leech leech, the journalist, the leech leech journalist of the leech artist starts to make his path to a six-figure salary. And the magazines become this thick. Thick as Vogue's, the source is. And we say that they have integrity. And you see the same artist. They go, we don't want to hear radio with the same artist. But the same artist adorned the double XL cover for an entire year. That's the dark ages. The dark ages where MF Doom, as last week as I explained, go back to my last two shows, episode 52 and 51, for some of my talk on MF Doom, and how he dominated and made an entire cult following with quality and next level evolution, evolution of battle rhyming, of slow flow cadence, continuing the torch of reigniting dirty, grimy sampling where you don't care if the chop is sloppy on one and it loops wrong and on the next, you keep rhyming, right? Oh, he, he samples Sade and the vocal clip comes out here and then it's chipped off. The, it's all messed up. No, it's not. It's Doom's record. That's the way he did it. And for the entire 2000s, half of the decade, more than half of the decade passes and not one of these magazines does a feature story on him. But we see featured stories, though, on artists that innovate the celebration of Scissor. And I'm disgusted. I'm in these magazines in the Dark Ages. I'm living in the Dark Ages. I'm living inside The European 17, 1600s Dark Ages, where all of these people don't bathe themselves of the pop filth that is causing disease all around them. Diseases. They don't bathe themselves. Eminem's the goat after one album. That's a mutated virus on your face. That's a virus on your face. It's a skin disease you've got. One white, skilled, 
rapper with some of the corniest, most disrespectful and cliche gimmicks of what white people are, and you call him the GOAT. Because he raps fast. Got 50 brothers behind me rapping fast. He's funny. I got brothers that have laughed you under the table. Five Sean Price songs will laugh you under the table. And now all of the people that this music extends to globally, they copy a cliche because it finally comes in a skilled package of some sort. The corniest package I can ever think of, but that's how it came. And I'm getting heated because it led to countless artists being shunned. Countless artists being shunned. And we have to wait to the next decade to get an MC of depth like a Zagnif Nori, uh, 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 a subtext, wooden chains, lyricist, poets, code nine. Because the only rapper that's white that they'll sign has to be corny and he's got to do a thousand types of drugs. Silliness, though. They want us, black and brown, to represent for our people. They can't even represent. I'll take a gamble. I go to a trailer park out there in Detroit, though, and they're not all acting that way. And if you want to eight mile this up, I'll say this to the end of time. Real MCs consulted on that eight mile. But that eight mile, the director took his own liberties. And Eminem flew with the liberties. Because back when battle rap was burgeoning, no, you didn't go into a place filled with brothers and insult the brother down to this very last bone and survive. That culture, that, that, to me, that vibe had to be worked towards, though. Worked towards, too. And when Eminem was rhyming, though, he was self-deprecating. His early come up, he was self-deprecating. He wasn't stepping up to you and, 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 and insulting your whole life. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like that. And this is the 2000s. In the 2000s, they sold to us, though, that we will fall in love with the rapper that we can relate to. So instead of lyrics, putting us into a place of people that we can look up to or look at and say, these are their stories, not my stories. And I'm listening to his stories and parts of his stories I respect because I relate to. Other parts of his story I relate to because of his integrity and his talent. And now it's who you relate to the way a pop record is sold. And that has to do with the media I was at too. And so now people like Jay-Z with their skill and their talent with their exceptional skill and talent can pitch you can pitch to people and have people saying in the hood say I listen to Jay-Z because I relate to the pitching and I relate to those days where I was thinking of the evils you wasn't thinking of Jack you didn't have Jack on your mind you were scared out of your wits when you were in the street you did it every day because you were too stupid to go to school. You did it every day because you didn't know how to do anything else and you were scared not to do what everyone else was doing. It wasn't no pitcher bowling. Who's that best Dwight Gooden? In your mind though, you were you, you were Cy Young 85. You was a Cy Young 85. A lot of talent and being an 85er, you was Dwight Gooden. A Cy Young 85er, a super talented 85er. They thought they was good on the street pitching, but they were really good in, in the Yankee years, coking up. So the music, they got us... Loving the music in the street. They got our people thinking, this is the music I love because I relate to it. 
I relate to him in the street pitching. And then you don't relate to anything. You were dreaming along with, with Jay-Z. You were dreaming. And that was your escapist music. Middle-aged women all over the globe, they're watching, they keep it real. They watch soap operas and they think of a better marriage and they think of being on an island somewhere. And the soap shows you them on an island, though, fighting bad guys and saving your ass. Escapist materialism. Escapist uh, uh, frivolous hedonism. That's what was pitched to us. Masterpiece hold legacy. I remember in New York, that was the first time, the dark ages, the first time I saw hardcore brothers in the street making music. And they said, yo, forget that Wu-Tang stuff. Forget krs one and all that. We need to make records like this. And they show me a no limit record. The early, the beginnings of filler. The beginnings of filler, where you fill up a whole record of just songs. Songs for the hell of it. That's what they like. And the ethos of what Diddy popularized as a thing. The pop A side, the hardcore B side, no longer needs the B-side to be that gritty anymore. And after a while, the B-side is just a pop song that wasn't as pop as the A-side. Everything got diluted. Freestyle Fridays. Freestyle Fridays, what a joke. Some of the greatest MCs have lost Freestyle Fridays. Immortal Techniques, Sky Zoo, the list goes on and on. You know why? Because in the Dark Ages, that particular show and segment made freestyling a shits and giggles contest. Whoever has the most cute little jokes wins. I remember when I, when I first met Immortal Technique, he, ba he gave a battle rap. Not battling anybody, he just gave a hardcore battle bars rap. You know, and I was one of the panelists on, on the event prior. Next kid to come up to rhyme, though, he got scared. That's how tough Immortal Technique was rhyming back then. He got scared. He, he gave it to me. He said, I don't, I don't want to go next. I said, I said, brother, I don't even rhyme. I don't even rhyme. This is sad. Go ahead. Rhyme about daisies and, and flowers and stuff, something. Don't give me the mic. I already spoke my piece on the mic. This is the dark ages. The dark ages where the best records that really could change and changed an entire people's way of thinking and re-inspired them. Works by Dead Prez. Because Dead Prez came out 2000. Works by Dead Prez. In, in 2000, Dead Prez. Let's get free. Supreme clientele. These works have seminal effects through the MF Doom's work, seminal effects on the underground, right? Immortal Techniques, Revolutionary 1, and especially Revolutionary Volume 2 send ripples throughout the underground community of people of all shades, poor, downtrodden, with little money, rethinking things and they start thinking differently and you know what you open the magazines I was at and they're nowhere to be found you know what I mean it's like I worked at a polka magazine I worked at polka magazines because I I wrote about music that I did not have in my collection because it sucked I didn't have it and then I went home and listened to a totally different music don't tell me it's different types of hip-hop. Don't tell me it's different type of hip-hop because Kenny G is not Miles Davis. They're not different types of jazz. 
Some of the jazz funk is not jazz funk. It is just funk. It doesn't have any real jazz aesthetic in it. And it's dope. And this is why Amir Baraka hated on Weather Report. Weather Report got a lot of nice records. But they didn't do a lot of jazz. And for the amount of innovation that happened up to the point of Weather Report, whatever jazz they were doing was hardly in the scope of where jazz had elevated to. So it's a funk record. It's a different record. Guy plays a trumpet on the band. Doesn't mean that you got a funk record all of a sudden. I mean a jazz record. So the media influence is deifying pseudo goats. Overrating them. Jay-Z's immediately the goat. I had, I had writers tell me Eminem was the goat when they told me, check out this album, Slim Shady. The closing, here are some other points. That's why this is the intro. Closing, the closing of underground graduation. The mediums of the real underground, Stretch and Bobbito, Awesome 2, right? Pete Rock, Future Flavors, right? With Marley Marr. The, they find you the music and the best music that a lot of this music is going to appeal to a lot more people than you think. They're supposed to graduate because of skill, talent, and charisma and graduate. And some of the last ones graduated in 1988 and they closed shop. They put the hammer down and they closed shop. Lo they, they, put a little, they had a little door opening and they said, Lauren Hill, squeeze through, most deaf, and big pun. And they, they closed the door. No one else could come through, right? No, no one else was able to come through. And so you don't see a synergy. You see a, the 2000s, you see an overcrowding of the underground where the mixed DJs, they, have to, they can't really honor both. They can't honor what is really great from what just happened and then what, what is happening in the future. So they can't, they have to bring you a Mr. Liff and his incredible I Phantom album. And instead of him graduating to some kind of level where he gets some mainstream appeal, he doesn't. Because you know why? Because the mainstream by then has so rapidly deteriorated that he's no good. It's no good anymore. You know what I mean? You get a dilution because the best, the quality, a lot of quality MCs start to dilute their own music willingly. And you get the era also of talented MCs who never are MCs. Enter ludicrous. Just come right in, right in, just come right in. MCs that are smart, that have lyrical skill, but have also other acumen, like his uh, radio degree. I forget which degree. You look it up. Ludacris has a degree. Little Wayne went to college, though, and he said all that stupid stuff. You know what I mean? He said all that dumb stuff. He'd probably do better in college than me. You know what I mean? So instead of you get the easy ease back in the day where this is what they really needed help writing their rhymes. They didn't really know. You know what I mean? But they had, they had all the other tools of the MC, so they could, they could deliver, they had cadence, they had voice and pitch, AZ had all those nice gifts. But they didn't know what to say for a prolonged period of time. But now, now we dumbify ourselves, and we give you this dumb product because I did research. You know what I mean? Before Facebook came up with the algorithm, there was the niggerim, the nigga algorithm, where you niggerize yourself. I'm not going to, I'm in places with real MCs, MCs that want to MC and rhyme, and we're in a room, and they're thinking about their nigger algorithm. What nigger rhythm am I going to bring? That's the nigger al algorithm. They're picking their nigger rhythm. How will I cross over before I cross over? You know what I mean? Because you got to cross over. You got you to gotta do your dance, get signed. And then... You got to keep it up. The singles. And then we get diluted on the underground. We get diluted 
retro hip hop. Diluted retro hip hop. Because Killer Army can't get a deal because Killer Army is too busy in the street, too busy being real. Too busy having the logical arguments of, of so many guys making music, brothers getting locked up, label situations and money and all that kind of stuff. So we got to get Jedi mind tricks though. Exceptional music from Stoop and pseudo Islamic rhymes and hardcore isms from Vinny Paz. And playing with my math and alphabet and playing like he's embracing any kind of Sicilian blackness that he could even embrace so he could later say he's an orthodox Muslim when and shift off and just say that, hey, I, I wasn't saying any of that stuff. Insert just a lot into the group for some verification. Though. It's completely diluted. You know? It's a diluted retro hip-hop. And all we got to really love was artists like Little Brother, but we missed out on so much other stuff. And I'm going to go into this stuff more on the next, uh, the next episode that I had. The next episode I decided to go into the Dark Age, but this really is a small uh, uh, um, intro because there was so much, you know what I mean? But um, I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there because I'm going to talk about this record. Newest record that has blown me away, like I really enjoyed it, Kev Brown on the beats and Jay Cyanide, Drum Machine Tape Cassette. That's the name of the album. You know you got to like it. Drum Machine Tape Cassette. Dope, dope album. You know what I mean? But um, so many other albums. So until next time, there'll be a lot more stories to tell, writings to recite, and records to rewind and reminisce. I'm your host, Sunni Zalah, a.k.a. Skill Straight Low, a.k.a. Survivor and Thriver past the Dark Ages into and through this invisible renaissance. And as always, the Power Right Show is a never-respect-fake broadcast. Peace. <laughs>